Back to school is so much fun, but it can also get really overwhelming when you are trying to buy things for your space, especially if you are trying to set up an innovative space like a STEM lab or a maker space, and there's just so much to buy. What should you buy? How should you go and attack this problem? What are our best practices so that you can build up everything that you want? I am Naomi Meredith, a former classroom teacher turned current K-5 through STEM teacher, and I love helping teachers like you navigate STEM and technology in their own classrooms. I am here to help to give some <laughs> advice and what I have experienced because I have definitely been in that position and I am in the middle of it right now. And there are lots of things that have worked well over the years to get to where my STEM room is where it is. So before we get started, whether you're watching live or you are here for the replay, definitely comment below what you teach and how long you've been teaching. Maybe you are just jumping into your STEM position this year and you've taught for a while, or maybe you are ready to go. You're teaching STEM. It's your first year ever, your first year teaching. Comment below. I would love to see who's watching and interact with you and get to know you better. So when you are getting started, some of these spaces have been used in different ways. You might be um, gifted or inherit different things. So list current assets that you have. If you do have some, you might even have some of your own prior to another classroom that you taught in. So make sure you just make a list of those things and also don't be afraid to get rid of things. When I came into my room, I was lucky that I got a brand new job, a brand new room, which I know isn't always the case, but all the things that I was inherited were all in boxes. And I actually had to unbox everything that was there from previous teachers. And then there was actually a uh, cabinet full of random stuff as well that was rolled into my room. So I took out everything, went through it, actually listed out everything that I had, got rid of things that didn't work, or if it was just one thing, I set that aside that could be used for prizes. Um, and also, yeah, I ha there was even some CD players that we didn't need anymore. So it's okay to get rid of things. Now you're getting rid of stuff, but also think about what are some assets that you can gain from other classroom teachers. My room didn't have a whole lot of things to build with, especially for younger students. A lot of the stuff was for upper elementary, even middle school. Some of it wasn't even age appropriate anyway developmentally appropriate. So I really needed some building supplies and a lot of the primary teachers were getting rid of some of their manipulatives. They just um, had other curriculums or they're cleaning out their closets. They had way more than they needed. So I actually took those math manipulatives and added them to my building collection, which was really great. I didn't have to go and buy it. It was already in the building and it was being repurposed in some way. So this is a great place to get started. Think of it like a garage sale. What are you going to keep? What are you going to toss? And then you can definitely build and grow from there. This next one is creating your budget. Now, a lot of us are actually given the budget that we are told to spend, um, or maybe you are going to give yourself a budget to purchase things. That is so kind of you, but create that budget. And also, if your school is the one providing the budget, understand what are the parameters around it. Are you purchasing things on your own and turning in the receipts? Do you have to spend the money by a certain amount of time? That's actually also very important. I have to spend mine I think by March. And so I have to really be thoughtful about how I can make the money last up until March and what I really, really need. So think about those rules and parameters around your budget. And this budget, of course, just like with anything, is going to help determine what you are going to purchase. So this budget piece is really helpful for the next steps that I'm going to talk through. So when you are purchasing, you really want to think about planning ahead. Um, so again, this will go into other things, but don't spend, if you can, don't spend everything all at once. <laughs> um, you do want to save a little bit left over for planning ahead. So when I'm thinking about planning ahead, maybe you have things as a wish list that you would love to buy later on, um, save some money for that. You know there's going to be a sale, so you're not going to buy that right away. 
Also, when you're thinking about consumables and not consumables, and we'll go into that, you might want to save some of the money. Maybe you need to buy more batteries. Maybe you need to buy more masking tape. I always have to buy more masking tape all the time. Um, also, if things break, is your budget responsible for things that are broken and need to be repaired? So that's really going into what is your budget used for in this school? Is it used for repairs? Is it not? Is that something that you give to the PTO or you have have to write a grant for. So you really want to think about those variables and planning ahead. You don't need to save too much. If you could save $100, that would be great. But um, think about what you need to do for planning ahead and I guess an, a rainy day emergency fund. Now, again, this goes into your consumables and non-consumables. So when I'm thinking about a STEM room, your consumables are the things that you have in a makerspace. And oftentimes, you don't really have to buy a whole lot for a makerspace, but there are some things that are really helpful and really popular. Popsicle sticks, pipe cleaners, those Chanel straws, and masking tape are my three biggest that get used throughout the year, and they get used pretty quickly. Now, this goes into a whole other thing when you are planning your lessons. Um, I made the mistake when I first started, I just let the kids use whatever they wanted. You, Yeah, use whatever you want. Well, the first week, I ran out of everything, and their projects were ginormous. I couldn't store them anywhere, and I went and bought stuff on my own because that was my own fault. I felt so terrible. So when you're thinking about projects that use consumables, it is okay to put limits on um, on those projects. In fact, when I have kids building projects, I have them build them. They, they could fit in about the size of a gallon size grocery or a Ziploc bag. So the projects are smaller. And the good thing about having projects smaller, of course, it uses less materials, but kids are able to finish the projects in a shorter amount of time. So this was very helpful too, because it's not this big, overwhelming thing. And kids do get overwhelmed when it's really, really big. And so this actually helps cut down on that supply use. And then it is easier to store, which a lot of us have a lot of issues with. Some of us even teach all all the kids in the school for the whole week. I know there's a lot of STEM teachers out there and you guys have been messaging me. Some of you teach, I teach kindergarten all one day, second grade, or you teach, I teach K through five one day, the next day is the next group of K through five, and then you see them all like four times over the month. That's a lot of storage. So if you keep those projects small, your consumable cost will go down, but also you can store them a lot easier. Um, so think about that price. Thankfully, with the consumables, like I said, you won't have to buy a whole ton if you really think through it and the projects you're going to do. Not every project I do in my classroom is building. So that actually helps a lot. And this goes into the non-consumables. So think about things that you can use over and over again for multiple grade levels. If you can't buy anything else, if you have a very limited budget, you should buy. Here's what you should buy consumables. So buy masking tape, a lot of that. Uh, buy those popsicle sticks and uh, pipe cleaners. And then for the non-consumables, this will get the most out of your money is just basic Lego bricks. And some of you might even have these at home. But if that's all you can spend, if you only have $100, that is a great way to get started. All those makerspace things that I've talked about in other videos, but all those makerspace things that you can actually uh, collect yourself, ask for donations, and then you're on a great pace to get started. So don't feel like you need all the fancy things. And I know sometimes in my videos, like, oh my gosh, you have everything. This has been built up over years. I've, there's been teachers in my room before me, so I am very spoiled. However, I do understand um, that there's different ways to build up things and in different situations. So with those non-consumables, think about things that can be used over and over again. And you really actually, besides Legos, you can really, Lego, sorry, there's no S, um, you can never really have enough. But with the consumables like robot or non-consumables with robots, you don't need a whole class set. In fact, you can even start with four or two, and that can be a station. So that's a whole other planning method I would love to talk to you guys about, but really think about you don't need a class set for anything. This can actually change the way you plan. If you guys are enjoying this already, I saw some pop up on this side, but wherever you're at, make sure you guys like this video. If you're loving this content, this will help other teachers like you or now or even in the future find this video for what they need. So definitely give those thumbs up, those hearts, those likes. I definitely appreciate it. 
So when I talked about this for a second, but that quantity versus quality is also super important when you are purchasing. So again, you don't need a class set of everything. And in fact, technology especially, it goes out of date so quickly, you really don't want a class set because things can break. I have a set of Ozobots, wonderful robots. Right now, they're really hard to find. So hopefully they come back out with them. Um, I have about 12 of those, but what's really tricky is some of them are dying and I do have money I could replace them, um, but some of the technology is older. And I have some other robots that um, I had some old Sphero, don't even work anymore. There was a class set, they were purchased right before me. So quantity is really important, especially if it's the technology. I would not suggest getting more than 12, if that, <laughs> because they will die out over time. And then you're thinking about the replacement costs and if you should replace them and if you have enough. And of course, when you're teaching STEM, the point is to have kids, well, there's a lot of points, but you want kids to collaborate and learn and practice those communication skills. So if there's one robot for every kid, then they're working alone and they don't have that chance to collaborate. So the quantity piece, um, really think about uh, how you're gonna use that and this will cut down on your cost. Now quality as well, you really wanna go through and compare models. Now this is something that, um, especially with technology again, um, with things that are more robust, really compare those models. Um, I did this, my teacher, Honey and I, we need a vacuum because I lose a lot of hair. I shed a lot. And we needed a robot vacuum to vacuum for us every day because we're like that. And I don't like to vacuum, let's be honest. Um, but we compare the models and see, okay, so this one's this. We did buy a cheaper version. Didn't work. It lasted about a month. And then there's those repair costs. So just like your classroom, how good is it? So a good example for the classroom is you see the little code and go mice. They're little guys and they have buttons on the top and the kids press the buttons to code the mouse to where it goes. Great option, it's screen free, which is amazing. And kids have that hands-on learning and it has that output right away. So there's the code and go mouse, they're about $20. and But there's a similar robot, different brand called B-Bots does the same actions, but they actually are a bit more sturdier. So when I'm comparing models, yes, I could buy a ton of the Code & Go mice, but when they're used by a lot of kids over the course of even a year, they do break down. So I see about 500 kids um, over the course of a month. And so I, for my situation, the Code & Go mouse isn't the best option. So I do upgrade a bit and have those B bots because they are sturdier and last longer through all the kids and dropping. They do drop um, and all of that use. But if you are teaching in a smaller setting, let's say you're a classroom teacher, you're trying to implement a robotics station, I actually would recommend the Code & Go mouse because it is cost effective. You don't have as many kids using it throughout the year. And so that might might be a different route for you. So think about the kids that you have, how um, the long-term goals, and then how you want to use them. So Suzanne uh, really loves using the B-Bots, which I do as well. Now, this is like the ultimate goal. I actually don't start off with this way, um, but once you have assessed everything, you know what you have, you've cleaned out everything, you've set your budget, uh, this is a great time to think about donations and grants and if that is a possibility. A lot of people reach out to me, oh, what should I use for grants? A great place to get started is Donors Choose. Um, definitely ask your school if that's something you're able to do. I know some schools put limits on Donors Choose, but I love Donors Choose and I've had things funded before as as a STEM teacher and also as a classroom teacher, it actually guides and walks you through the whole process of how to write a grant and it gives you examples and they even review your grant to make sure that it works. And the cool thing about it too is they actually set up the purchasing. So their company has grown so much in the fact that they've connected with a lot of other places that you can purchase from and they've made the process a lot easier. So definitely start with Donors Choose. Also, there, think about local companies in your area, especially if they are focusing on STEM and technology. A lot of local companies want to get involved with schools and sometimes they don't even know how or even a way in and they actually appreciate if you reach out to them as a teacher and I know it might be scary at first the worst they can say is no you never know <laughs> until you ask so local companies are really thinking about things that they can use for a tax write-off 
There might be even some that you know about, but they're usually happy if you uh, create a plan or proposal or even look at how it's written on Donors Choose and think about how you can rewrite it in a way for a local company. That's a great option to go for if there's some bigger items you really need and you have this on your wish list, you have a lot of the other smaller things, this is a good avenue that you can try. Also, donations are amazing. Um, Sometimes those just happen as they go. I've had some families reach out to me, hey, my kids have grown up, I don't need these anymore, would you be interested? That's been an amazing um, thing as well. Even hit up some garage sales if you're trying to build up. You never know what you're going to find and some people are even happy to donate from their own garage sale. So again, don't be afraid to ask, it could be scary. What's the worst, they say no. Okay, then you move on and try a different way. But this is kind of the last option I go with after everything I have planned out. And you create that wish list on the side. Sometimes people will reach out to you randomly and you're like, oh, I don't know what to buy. It's really good to have a plan set in place, your wish list and will it cost, what brand. So if they ask you on the spot, you are prepared and you know exactly what you want. Now, some of you are like, oh my gosh, just tell me what to buy. I want, like, just tell me what in the world should I buy? Okay, so this is part, if you have watched it this long, you are definitely in the right place. So this has taken time because I know it's important and who else out there is gonna tell you exactly what to buy and how much? I am. <laughs> so if you guys uh, use this link, it's naomimeredith.com slash bootcamp giveaway to TWO, so you have to spell this all one word, you will not only receive a whole entire spreadsheet for free, so this is all categorized by recommendations of things that I have used in the classroom with kids in real life. It is categorized by categories, of course, categories, categorized, categorized by categories. So um, you have the science, manipulatives, math, things I recommend for makerspace, technology, and there's even notes on the side of what why I recommend it or how many that you should purchase, just recommendations. And then the first part of that spreadsheet is also a different budget. So if you only have $100 to spend, what should you buy? If you have 300, what should you buy? And I go up in different price ranges just to give you an idea of how you can even build up over the years or how you can even spread out how to spend everything. So this is completely free, so just use that link on the screen. And also when you use this link in real time, uh, you are entered to win a potential Amazon gift card. And so that will, you'll be notified by the end of the week if you are a winner on Friday, if you're watching this in real time. So you get all of that. You get that whole inventory spreadsheet to help you with purchasing and also enter to win an Amazon gift card so it can help you add even more to your own classroom. So thank you so much for joining me. On top of that, if you even have part of your budget, I even made my store 20% off right now so that you can buy things at a, a lower cost if you're really stretching that budget so that you can get everything started, save some time, enjoy the last part of your summer, and get everything prepared for your new classroom. Thank you so much for joining me for another day of STEM boot camp. Um, of course, you might be watching this live or the replay. Thank you so much for being here. All, all of the three boot camp days are listed on my website. So it's at naomimeredith.com slash STEM boot camp where you will have all the videos and links and resources in one place so you don't have to go searching for them. I love also connecting with teachers. I'm very active on Instagram. So you can find me at, at naomimeredith underscore. And then also, if you're not filling the Instagram and want to write an email, I'm down with that too. So I'm contact Naomi Meredith at gmail.com. Thank you so much again for joining me. I am so happy to be here and serve you on your STEM and technology journey. I'll talk to you soon.